Le cheval plaît beaucoup. Hein. C'est un vecteur de communication extraordinaire. Avant d'être un cavalier, c'est important d'être un, un horseman. Always put the horse before the personal ambitions. Vraiment un cheval incroyable. Voilà quelqu'un qui est champion olympique et qui n'est pas ordinaire. Se remettre en question et de se servir des défaites pour être meilleur après. Ce feeling, je l'ai eu directement avec Kellogg. On fait du haut niveau, il y a le côté financier, c'est comme ça. Aller en compétition parce qu'il est bon, pas parce qu'il paye une table. Moi, je veux pas courir mes chevaux pour l'argent. If you can do it in a way that doesn't take too much out of your horses. Quand on voit l'évolution en, en 10 ans de temps, qu'est-ce que ça va être dans 10 ans Pouvoir motiver les jeunes à aller au bout de leurs rêves. Forme de très très bons compétiteurs. Je ne vais pas dire que ça forme des hommes de chevaux. Pour moi, les bons moments, ils sont à venir. Aujourd'hui, réussir sa vie, c'est avoir la vie que l'on souhaite. This episode was recorded six months ago already. It was a very, very early morning at Equitalion when the world show was still asleep and we, for the first time, met a Swedish rider. But this time, it wasn't Peter Fredriksson or Henrik van Ackermann, and even less a jumping rider. It was a dressage rider. And his name must be familiar to you, given his remarkable track record, Patrick Kittel. European Championships, World Cups, World Equestrian Games, and Olympic Games, Patrick Kittel is an accomplished sportsman who still dreams of high-level sport, but above all, seeks happiness. What drives him every day? being surrounded by his family, loved ones, and his horses. And I do believe that this October morning, we were lucky enough to meet a true horse lover, a passionate and hardworking sportsman. He shared his mantra with us, follow your heart, do what you love doing, and success, business, and everything will follow. And for those of you who have been following along, you already know it. Releasing this episode has been particularly challenging. So please help us support this discipline, spread the word about dressage and about Patrick Kittel by sharing this worthy and deeply exciting episode with at least two friends from the equestrian industry. Don't hesitate to send us a message, to comment on this interview and to drop us a five-star rating on Spotify and Apple Podcast. Hello, Cassandre. Hello. Thanks for having me here. I'm here at Jiva Hill Sables, your general director. Um, of the event that will take place in August, but also of the Sables. Can you tell us a little bit about Jiva Hill Sables, their purpose, also their location and their story? Yes, hello. So thank you for coming at uh, Jiva Hill Stables. So the stables were built in 2005 in the heart of a 50-hectare estate uh, that is located in Crozet, that is in the foothill of the Jura. Uh, it also overlooked by the Mont Blanc, and it's only 20 minutes away from Geneva, so we have a very, very nice uh, area. amazing. <laughs> Uh, the infrastructure is dedicated to dressage. Uh, so we have 25 styles, uh, soon two indoors arena. One is still in construction, two outdoors arena, lunging rings, and a beautiful counter tracks and many paddocks for the, for the horses. You're part of Diva Hills Resort, which is a hotel. Can you tell us about this wonderful and very unique hotel? Yeah, so um, we are lucky to be in the same property at the Zivail Resort, which is a five-star hotel and Relais Chateau, which is really a magical place where you can find two restaurants, a spa, and also a golf. So it's a very complete uh, destination. And we can tell that everything here in the Sables has been designed and imagined for the horses, for the wellness and the well-being of the horses and their owners. How has the team imagined such a level of high details for horses? So uh, the stables, as I said, was contracted in 2005. Since then, we have been uh, looking around, um, moving in different countries and different stables and uh, trying to import a little bit of everything into the stables uh, to create the best possible stables, we think. So we still have a lot to, to do, but uh, we're trying to do our best and uh, we're evolving uh, year after year to find the best technology. Uh, we just created a new tack room uh, with lots of equipments uh, to dry it and to make it very easy for competition. So trying to evolve in that way. So you're fully dedicated to dressage. Why dressage and why has Jiva Hill such a special bond with this discipline? 
So uh, the owner, uh, which is Virginia Lunding, uh, has always been doing dressage. It's her main uh, discipline. Um, so this is why dressage is the most important. It's really dedicated to dressage. And it's also a beautiful sport. And we uh, are happy to welcome everybody that loves the dressage. And uh, everything was constructed around this discipline, going to the floor, uh, of the um, trainings even outdoors and everything that comes from the launching arena and and all even the stalls yeah it's been constructed around this discipline and for the benefits of it so uh every discipline has their specificities and we try to have the best ones for the dressage and for the horses um and the best equipment we also have a treadmill to to train them and we also have a counter track with different elevations uh, that permits them to really train correctly and to have the force they need to do the dressage discipline. So for a couple of years now we have been organizing dressage contests, dressage competitions and this year will be unique as this is the first year you're organizing a five-star dressage competition. Can you tell us about this very specific and unique event? So yes, indeed. So um, our sixth edition is really uh, marked by this five-star evolution. Uh, so the competition uh, was only created in 2016 and was uh, for the first time a national. And then in 2017, we did an international. Since then, it continued growing. So we're really happy to be able to do a five-star. Uh, we won't only have that level. We'll also have um, one, two, three stars and young horses, uh, U25, and also two amateur tours. Uh, so we really want to create a, a complete competition. For all dressage lovers. For all dressage lovers, yes, indeed. And the optimum ones are the five-star ones. So we're really happy to be able to welcome them. So you have been since last October in the middle of a huge renovation, huge work um, outside to create new arenas, to create better facilities. And I know that uh, because you have you have allowed me to visit the facility before we started recording. I know that the whole team is thinking far in the future while doing this work. It's not just about this five-star event. It's about investing and um, upgrading all the facilities to be able to welcome new competitions in the future. Can you tell us a little bit about all the specificities that you have um, that are under progress? Yes, indeed. So we have started already last year a new construction. Uh, for the 2022 edition last year, we already had the outdoor arena. Uh, but uh, in 2000, October 2022, uh, the new building started uh, that is composed of an indoor arena uh, that will be able to welcome indoor competitions. So we had the correct dimensions to be able to do an international inside. Uh, we also have a big uh, terrace uh, that will be used for uh, the hospitality and the welcoming visitors. Uh, we also created an underground with professional kitchen as well as a 7 million liter water reserve that will be used to collect water from the roofs and also of the outdoors arena. And we will reuse the water too, again, for the outdoors arena and for the horses in general and for the entire property. So we are less than two months away from the show. It's a huge challenge for you. And I will be posting on socials, on I'm an Ecosian socials, um, the pictures and the videos because everything is still under progress. So we're just going to have to tell to the uh, audience to come to the events, uh, August 3 to 6. Can you tell us a little bit who is allowed to come? Is it open to the public? How does it work to come and to admire all the dress and horses? So the competition, as you said, will be uh, from uh, 3 to the 6, uh, so from Thursday to Sunday, and the access is free uh, on the day, so you can come and enjoy the show, have a lunch uh, without any problem. Um, so we'll have two main events. On the Friday, uh, we have um, a horse show that is called Caval Show that will be coming. Tickets will soon be available online. And visitors will have different options for food. Uh, we have a brand new terrace uh, that will be open for lunch and dinner. Everything you need to have a good time and watch a beautiful sport. So everyone is welcome here at Jiba Hill Sables in August to be able to keep updated about the progress, about the work, and also about the riders' master list that's still not available, obviously. How can we do uh, so you can follow us on social media. We have an Instagram account and a Facebook account. We also have a website and everything is found under Jivage Stables. Uh, you can find us easily. 
I can only recommend people to go and check and um, subscribe to your channels, to your socials, because the work here is, is incredible. And I'm sure that the event will be a huge success. We really hope so. We really hope also that uh, riders and visitors will like the new building. So please come and I will be really happy to welcome you. And now it's time to listen to Patrick Kittel. Good morning, Patrick. Good morning. Uh, so, Patrick Kittel, you are 46 um, years old. You were born in Sweden and still carries a Swedish nationality. You're one of the greatest figures in international dressage. You have a very long list of achievements and numerous participations in major championships, including European Championships, World Championships, Olympic Games, World Cup Finals. Um, you participated in the Olympic Games three times, Beijing 2008, London 2012 and Tokyo 2021. Um, and you also have had several Swedish championship titles to your name. Today you are number eight in the world in your discipline. I read you were not raised in a horse family, so maybe I'd like to ask you first, this is not the easiest question, but how did you end up becoming one of the best riders in the world? <laughs> well, you, you dig in right to the, to the difficult questions at once. I think for me, um, it's very much dedication, it's very much hard work, uh, but it's also my absolute passion to, to work with horses, and I could have ended up with any category. I could have been a jumper, I could have been a voltage. It doesn't really matter to me. I just, I love being around animals and particularly horses for me is such a interesting way of, of um, communicating because you can learn a horse so much and you, when the horse understands you as a rider, like I always say, I, I like going to a show but I love working at home because I love when the horses start understanding me, when they start doing things for me, when, when my signals become their signals and the horse's signals become my signals and I think that's what always encouraged me to keep going, educating more horses and, and always figure out what you know, what does this horse need. Every horse is very individual. It's the same when I meet people. I always try to meet everyone as an individual and not just like do one thing it's like everyone is different everyone is has their character their their things that they're scared of or doing well and so on and i think that's the clue to my success so far is that i don't generalize anybody not horses not humans not anyone i just try to figure out the person or the horse that i work with and try to make the best out of the situation and i also think that my wife at least says that i am very very stubborn and very very patient so it's a combination that I, I do use a lot. Like I, I wait it out. I just keep doing my thing, doing my thing. And eventually you and your horse, you understand together and then it works. And that's what brings success together with, of course, you have to be a little bit street smart. You have to be, as I brought, was brought up from a family with absolutely no money, no horse interest, no nothing. I had also to make a living out of horses, you know, because horse sport is expensive. And it costs money and you have to keep them going. It's the vets and the shows and so on. So I had to also become a little bit of an entrepreneur as well as a horse rider. And, and I'm quite proud to say what I built up in the almost 20 something years that I've been in the sport now. Maybe, Patrick, you can tell us how did you start your equestrian journey? Uh, what were the main steps or main people that led you to where you are today? I think the funny thing was that my first sort of girlfriend it sounds a bit funny but when I was 11 years old we were living on this farm and I met up with her she was like sort of the neighbor's girl and uh, she had uh, this fjord Norwegian fjord horses and a Shetland's pony cross and she said you want to come with me to the stable and because I liked her a bit so we took the bikes and we biked like almost for like eight kilometers to the stables and we were going riding and uh, I bicycled home eight kilometers to my mom and I said to my mom I want to do the Olympics and for me it was like I was like hooked on the horses from beginning. I just, I don't know why, but I just loved riding. And the cool part, if you're talking about people influenced me, was my mom. Because she, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you know, we don't have the money and we don't have this and we don't have that. But my mom looked at me and she said, you know what? Follow your heart and you will be very successful. And I keep doing exactly that advice. It's one of the best advices anyone ever given to me. Follow your heart, do what you love doing. And the success and the business and everything will follow you. 
So you started to ride with a Norwegian uh, pony or small horse, I don't know, tiny horse. And um, can you tell us about the steps that came afterwards? Like you started to ride, but you did not really know what discipline, what would be your journey. So what has been your journey so far? It was quite interesting because as we didn't have any money, we didn't have, couldn't afford horses. So I rented horses, I borrowed horses. And then um, my mom uh, bought me a horse for like 700 euros, which was two and a half. And she was like this big and I was growing and, you know, it was only rearing. When I when I broke it in, I was on the field and I thought, ah, now I ride it. So I jumped up bareback and rode it home bareback. It has never been ridden on, you know, like um, I still have pictures of actually of that day. Um, and then, you know, I kept riding and riding and riding and I just... I was never afraid of trying a horse. You know, if you gave me a trotter or a or a jumping or a galloper or a, I didn't care. I just wanted to ride. And as my mom is Hungarian, we had a summer house in in Balaton, which is a little lake, and they had a riding school next to it, sort of like where Germans came and they could borrow horses and ride. And I started riding there, and I started jumping, and I jumped up to 140, and uh, I did all of these things. But then, because this one horse that my mom bought was very bad at jumping. And every time I came to the first fence, I fell off. And then, you know, I went up and in the end, the speaker said to me, like, listen, Patrick, I'm very sorry, you know, but it's like now half an hour. You have to like go out because I was so like angry that I didn't make it. And then I started riding dressage. And this horse suddenly was a very normal horse, but she did a change. She did, you know, I started doing half passes. Then I suddenly won a small class, the, you know, the club championship. And, and that's the way it goes. But till this day, I am still very much into jumping as well like I get along really well with the jumping colleagues I, I have a great talks with them when we're in Doha or wherever I like I really like to talk to the jumpers I really like to see what they do what they feel how the horse is what they we do it differently but in the end it's a horse and you work with the individual the horse so I steal a lot of ideas from people so that's why I think any type of horse sport interests me you think you can learn from like different discipline? Like, you, could you learn something useful for dressage from a jumper rider? Oh, thousands of things. But I, I learn from any anybody, any sport, any 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 human being that is successful or smart or doing things. I always try to steal something, and it's the same. Like this morning, I already watched. We had the sound check, and I watched the jumper and said, "Oh, this one rides this one a little bit more in the frame up, and this one rides a little bit lower." And like, I always like to looking and be open to new ideas open to new inventions but that's the same for me with riding and business and everything i do i always listen and want to learn i'm very eager to learn and that's i think is the main thing don't be afraid of you know try things and then take it home and try maybe it's not for you but at least you tried and then you move on and you do the next thing and eventually you have sort of your puzzle finished and why did you start dressage after being a short jumper rider I think because this horse was just not at all talented for, for jumping. In the end of the day, I didn't have really a choice because I didn't have the money to buy an expensive jumping horse. And I had to get along with what I did. And, you know, then the success came and you sort of, you know, it just moved on. And I, I found out that I had a talent of teaching horses different things. You know, suddenly they did change and suddenly they did PF. I mean, super normal horses that just developed. And that's how I started it. It is not the easier question, Patrick, but can you tell us more about your personality, your character? Who are you? Apart from <laughs> stubborn and uh, patient. Yeah. <laughs> I hope I am a kind person. I hope I, uh, I'm a very family-oriented person. I am very keen on my family. I am uh, very loyal to the people that I really like. Um, I am also very difficult when someone hurt me. I'm very, I have a problem really forgiving. Like, I am not the person that really, I can tolerate people, but I don't forgive really very easy. Um, I hope I'm very passionate. I hope I, I give young people something back. For me, it's always about, like, one, like yesterday, for example, I came out of the prize given, these four kids were standing and they gave me high five. And I was like, tuck, 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 tuck. and that is for me, you know, the ultimate happiness. Like, when I see young people, kids or older, anybody coming and enjoying you know, the horses and the sport and, and liking seeing us competing. I think that is something of my character that I like doing, you know, just inspire people to, to do something, anything. 
Have you had mentors along the way? Like, did you ride with specific uh, trainers, uh, dressage people, or even from other disciplines? Um, I did. I have had special trainers through my career. I, at the moment, we have Luis Nartos, who is great. She's our sort of supervisor for the Swedish team. She's with me here. She's very good for me on the show. She doesn't really interfere, but she just gives me small tips. I go to Isabel Wert in between. She lives an hour and a half, and we do more like training and discussing stuff. Um, I have a fantastic um, physio guy. I have also a very, very good mental coach called Shelly Enhager. He's helped me mentally now for over 20 years. And It's a mental coach, right? Yeah. He's, he's really like, he's sort of like a positive coach. I can't, he's unique. Just He just works for me. He has so much positive energy. And so he's not a, excuse my French, bullshitter. He's like, he's honest. And he, he, he really makes you work with good things. And he has all through my entire career, really. I met him, like I said, when I was like 20. Okay. And he just always, and now we become actually really good friends. And I can just write him like two words and he could just write something back. And I'm like, immediately I pick up or, you know, laugh. Or when I see him, I already laugh. And he's just very good of helping me to, to you know, go through a good life. Because even if I have a fantastic life, you always have ups and downs. I always say life is not Instagram. You know, life is real. You have problems. You, you, you know, you stress with money. You stress with the horses. You, you know, the kid is sick. You, you know, you're up at five in the mornings. You know, like all these things. But in the end of the day, he always makes me say, okay, listen, what do you appreciate? What is the good thing in your life? Think of the good things and build from that. And that makes me always feel good and positive. And I think. If you feel positive yourself, you can always influence others, but you can't start by influencing others if you're not whole in your own body. That's super interesting because it seems that working on the mental preparation is quite new, maybe in equestrian sports more than all other sports. So you started to ride more than two decades ago uh, with, to train with the mental trainers. Um, do you think it has brought you a way to reach your goals like you wrote in the Olympic Games do you think it's correlated with oh, your mental training oh definitely I mean I wouldn't I'm not saying I wouldn't be there without him or with him because I think that's in the end of the day you can only you can only steer your own but he so for example he always says something really good that I can give a tip he says so there's it's my business your business and God's business So it says, my business is all I can influence, my horse, myself, my physique, my ability to think. Then it's your business, what you do, how you perform. I can't influence that. So there's no point for me to stressing about who is competing with you or who is here or is this the Olympic champion here or this, because I can't influence that anyway. And then it's God's business. And that is if, you know, it's hails when you compete or if the freeway runs down and you, you're late for the show, you can't control it. So what he says is you control but you can control it, that's your business. And that helped me immensely because when I was, I was very insecure and I thought I'm not good enough and I'm, you know, I'm not, I don't belong here, I don't have the money, I'm a guy, I'm like, you know, all these things, the negative thoughts that made me very insecure as a rider. And he said, you know, influence your own thing, make your own way, make your own path. And that really helped me through my entire career. Patrick, can you tell us more about your system, about the people and horses that are in your team? What are the key factors with the high level in dressage in 2022? I think, first of all, you have to have, obviously have good horses. But I think good horses you also create. There is no, you know, Bella Rose or Totelas of Allegro. They're all created. Because I think if they wouldn't have come to the right rider, they could have just also ended up at the riding school. It's, it's a lot about getting the right rider with the right horse at the right time. And I always think, you, you again, you create your own possibilities. So when I, I, I look at horses and I educate horses, but I don't say, a lot of people always say, oh, the horse is not good enough, or I'm not good enough. Or, but then you already made up your mind. And I don't think, that, I said, oh, this horse can win the Olympics. And if you do that, okay, maybe you don't win the Olympics, but at least I can guarantee you, you'll come much further Then when you say this horse will never do Grand Prix, because then you already mentally said, okay, it's not going to work out anyway. And I think that's a key factor when we work with the horses. We don't judge. I don't judge the rider. I don't judge the horse. I see a horse-rider combination in front of me. I don't care who you are, what money you have, what, whatever. It's, we work for a goal to get better. And I think that's one key. And I think the other key is obviously 
I am very disciplined. Like I'm up swimming at 5.30 every morning. I, you know, I work out, I, I eat, I don't drink too much alcohol. I, I ride, I train. I like, it, it's a living. It's not just sport. It's, it's, a, it's a concept. But when you look at the tennis players, so I had the pleasure of meeting a lot of really cool other athletes. They're all the same. They're all so dedicated to, to what they do. So can you explain a little bit the systems that surround you? What are the people you can count on in the team and how is it built for you? Do you buy your own horses? Do you have owners? Well, um, first of all, my team, like obviously my wife Lindel is the key member in my team, to be really honest, because she's also very good on ground me when I get, you know, too like out there and forget about, you know, everything else. I just like her bumble through and she's like, hello, you know, you kind of have to do this and you, you know, like... We have to do something here or, you know, no, you cannot work till like 10 every day. You know, we have family. Like she's so good on, in a really good way to, to making me stay very grounded in, in, the, in not just with the horses, but in, in life in general. And she's also very good for me to just, you know, bowl my insecurities or my successes or her successes and her. Like we, we match very well. Then I have Marlin, which is my rider. She's been with me for 12 years and she's like just does everything she rides she she i could not literally not live without her and she, i trust her 1000 with everything like she's a real team she also been reserved to the europeans she's also won and she's made herself a respectable name and she's very very good then i have marie my groom she's been 17 years with me and uh, you know like she's she got the fei award for best groom of the year last year and she's unbelievable like i could not make it without her but it's trainers it's And the thing is, like, you have to find your people, the people that work for you, the people that you are comfortable because you are different than me. So you probably work with other people, like, different or, you know, but you have to find what fits for you. And I think that's the key. And when I was younger, I was a bit afraid of conflict. So I didn't, I didn't want to really, you know, like, tell exactly how I felt. But now, as I'm getting older, I'm much more straightforward. And, okay, this is not okay. We have to fix this. Tuck, 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 tuck. And, and that, I think, is really good for my system. When it comes to how it is, I have some horses that I myself, but as I said, I was also a bit of an entrepreneur. I sold one of my companies to uh, Waterland, a very big Danish investment company, a couple of months ago, which made a very, very good profit for me. And they are also supplying us with horses and we sell and stuff. But I always, I always had this idea that I will always, no matter how many horses I sell, I will always have one horse, But I can always do sport, I can always be on the top, I can always be around. Because for me, it's like writing is a bit like a, like a newspaper. You know, if you're not in the news every day, people forget you. So you have to like always keep putting yourself out there and write. And I like it. So you have a wife who is a key member of your team and a do one daughter? One daughter, yes, Emilia. So how do you manage your career and your personal life? Uh, have you found the right balance between family time and sport? That is a very difficult balance, to be honest, because, you know, I thought when I sold the company that it would be easier, quieter, less, you know, you have enough money, you don't have to worry about money, yourself, you know, all these things. But it's not because I want to do good. I want also for the new company to get the best out of me because that's what they bought. So it's a lot of work and I'm away and I compete. Luckily, my wife is also a very successful rider. So she's also aware a bit what it is. But what I do now is I try to start very early so that I'm finished. Like I always bring Emilia to kinder, like a daycare. Uh, so 8.30, I always bring her. Lyndall makes her in in the morning. 8.30, I bring her until 9 and it's always like my time. And then I try to finish around three so that I then in the afternoon, she comes back at two from daycare and then Lindel does a little bit with, the, with lunch and then we spend the afternoon together. We're walking, we play, we do stuff. And I'd always like stop everything for her. Like from, from it's just how it is. And on Sundays, I used to work Sundays, but now it's like, no, no clients on Sundays. I'm not riding on Sundays. It's like family days. So I think... We try to balance it. Of course, sometimes I wish I could do it even better, but we, we try. We can maybe talk about dressage. 
I'd like to ask your opinion on the evolution of the discipline. You've been riding for more than two decades at high level. You know the sports, you know the way it evolves. Can you let us know how you, see, how you experience the transition, the evolution of sports? We are very familiar with show jumping and we could tell that the classes are different, um, the people are different, the riders are better, more uh, professional now, and the horses are better. Is this the same for dressage? I definitely think so. It's funny to say the jumping because I also follow the jumpers. You know, like when I was a kid, we used to be in Gothenburg and you went to the nightclub because I didn't compete back then. And you saw all these jumpers. I'm not going to say any names, but they were all like really drunk and picking up girls. And, you know, and they three o'clock, they were still on the dance floor with the white bridges. And then, you know, they rumbled into bed. And then the next day they did the jumping. You don't see that at all. When I see people like Peter or Henrik or, you know, Scott or, or all these really famous jumpers, they... They, you know, they're all in the gym. They all eat well. They, they take a beer at night, but never ever like late. They, they up in the mornings. It's a totally different atmosphere to back then, and it's the same in dressage. It's much more about your body, your physique. It's not about being skinny. It's about being healthy, strong, healthy, well trained, balanced. You know, everybody works with physios, with with you know different personal trainers to to keep your body in a good shape because your body is what influences the horse no matter if it's jumping or dressage or three day or voltage whatever you do your body is what gives the horse the signals and that body has to be in balance so i see a huge difference in this in jumping as well as dressage as well in other disciplines is this the same for horses do you think that the way you take care of horses has evolved the way uh, you uh, breed horses also has changed oh definitely i think above all the management around the horses are a lot more now. It's the same thing there. We have the vets, we have the physios. You know, they, they go out much. Like when I started in Germany, no horses went out. They were all in the box. Lock, you know, you took them out riding in. Now, I mean, all horses go on the field. All horses go in the paddocks. They have, you know, boxes with windows. They have big boxes, paddock boxes. Like it's totally involved around the horses as well. We have, we know much more about the anatomic of the horse that it needs to like move more that also to show you see the grooms are all out walking them constantly and the moment anything opens they take them outside and we expose the horses much more in a natural way than than they did when i started riding 20 years ago so i think that's definitely involved and also the breeding has become much more specific to really like good horses so you know they're much more what do you call it, hotter, more sensitive, more, which makes also the riding more hot and sensitive. You have to be better. You have to be better, but also the competition has become better. It's the same in jumping dressers, whatever. You cannot, you know, be hungover and jump up on the horse and ride a 160 because you're not going to win the World Cup here in Lyon or anywhere else. The same in dressage. If you, if you go in and you make mistakes, then you're not going to be in the top. Simple as that. All disciplines taken together, we know that the welfare is a huge topic today and the problematics around the welfare is also evolved. Are you sometimes afraid that horse riding might be removed from the Olympics uh, Games at some point or even prohibited or widely restricted someday? I'm not afraid of that. What I am, I think first of all, riding has been done for thousands of years. A horse and a human has been worked together for thousands of years the horse has accepted a human the human has accepted the horse and we are taking the utmost best care of the horse when it comes to welfare so i am no i have no doubt in my mind that what we are doing with the horse is okay it's on the horse's terms the same when it comes to olympic olympics there is no other sport when men and women rides on the same term there's no other sport when you, when you work so close with an animal. It's all super guarded from vets, from stewards, from everything that's around the horse. So if something concerns me, then it's that people that has actually no connection to the sport at all sits on social media and blapples out a lot of, excuse my French, crap. And everybody who's in the higher boards, they listen and get scared because they think that these minority of a group are the ones that represent the entire world, which is not true. And I think instead of just listening to all these keyboard riders, maybe listen to the ones that are actually in the sport, listen to the vets, listen to the scientists, but also listen to the one that has the experience around horses. 
And I think we all need to work together to, to approve all of these things. But we have to watch it so that not someone says, oh, let's ride with a, a neck ring because that is the best thing for a horse. And then suddenly we're all riding with a neck ring because one wrote on social media that that was the way to go. I think it has to be based on science. It has to be based on, on people that not just in science, but also are involved in horse sports so that they also know what the combination is and then work from that. And I think we, we constantly approving welfare. I mean, if I... You know, have you seen all these pictures how it was in the war before? I mean, like, they, they were, like, with the zap, like, right in here. And, I mean, like, there was, like, horses were flying everywhere. And no one thought that was weird. You know what I mean? Now, I mean, we, we have so much care for the horses and taking them. And we have to watch so that we don't... I mean, a horse is a horse and a human is a human. We cannot humanize the horse. It is an animal. It's a big, strong horse as well. They also sometimes, you know, you need to make a clear ground. Okay, this is my space. This is your space. We work together. But it has to build a mutual respect. And I think the more you are with horses, the more you understand that mutual respect. And I think the respect between us, that is also welfare. We met yesterday with Lorenzo, um, the French. Love that guy. Yeah, the yeah, French I've flying seen man. Show so many. Uh, he's unbelievable. And um, you know, we were talking about the evolution of his show and the fact that he used to be a lot with bridles and everything, and now he works with free horses. And I used the word constraints. Like, did you decide to uh, remove all constraints and everything? And he replied. Well, for me, bridle and spurs and a, and a saddle, it's not constraints. It's just um, having a horse that respects and comply with its um, the way of moving. With a bridle, it's not a constraint. He can, he can move freely with a bridle, with a rider. Do you agree with that? I guess so, but... I think so. I think, like, it's with anything you do, you know, like, I always, I compare it a bit to kids. Like, you know, if you have, like, this one parent, And he screams on his kids all the time, and the kid just completely ignores it. And then on the other side, you have one parent, and he's like, uh uh. And the kids knows immediately, like, okay, I have to be still. You know, like, in, no matter what you do, if you ride bitless, bridleless, without saddle, you can still do not good. And you can the same when you ride. It, it's not what you use, it's how you do it and how you, how you use it. But I also have to say, I've watched Lorenzo for many, many years. I mean, like, from his way of just taking out the horses from the truck and they park in a certain way. I see him ride. I've seen him on so many shows and I, I have so much respect for him, the way he communicates with horses, because that's what's interesting is the communication with the animal. And I do the same with the dressers. We communicate in a different way, obviously, from him. But in the, in the way, it's the same for everybody. It's the communication between us. And I think that's the cool thing. And again, that's how I steal ideas. You know, if he can take, you know, 10 horses, canter around in an indoor with 20,000 people, I mean, I must at least, you know, be able to get my horse. I play with my horse in the indoor, for example, that I let him go and he follows me back to the stables. And, you know, I do stuff like this. You know, take stuff from, from everybody and see also his, his way or others' way of communicate with the horse. Patrick, last year at the Tokyo Olympic Games, you had to withdraw from the competition after your horse, well done, tripped in while training. Uh, horse riding is such an unpredictable sport. How do you handle setback like this one? When you have been training and working so hard for months and suddenly just one clumsy step prevents you from chasing your dream? I think when you've been in the game as long as I've been, you also know that horses, this can happen to horses. Uh, I'm not going to deny saying that this was one of the hardest periods in my time because, you know, it was the day before the vet check. The horse has been going fantastic. I won everything I started. The horse was ranked number five in the world. Um, I came there, everything was set up, and then she tripped in the training uh, and got lame. My first concern was, okay, is she okay? Like, for me, that's like, I forgot about the Olympics. I forgot about everything because it was such a hard road getting there with all the corona, with the registration, everything was around. But I just wanted to make sure that she was, you know, feeling well. And once I've got that, that, you know, she was okay, like, you know, not compatible, but, but okay, so that it didn't hurt. Um, I said, okay, then, then I think for me the, the sort of disappointment stage came, like all the training all the work all not just that but also the whole thing like we lived in this 
in a village. I mean, I love the Olympics, but you know, we, I lived in a paper box with a paper bed in a little room all alone, away from my family who sacrificed, you know, my daughter sacrificed her daddy for like five weeks because he went to the Olympics and, and I couldn't compete. And um, I was there also as a trainer, which was also hard for me because I had to sort of not let my sadness influence them. So because they were there to do a good job as well and they've been training as well and they've been, you know, chasing their dreams. So I had to be sort of shut that part down. So I, I really remember like when I went out in the morning, I was like sort of a little bit like here, yeah, great pretender from Freddie Mercury. You know, I put the smile on and I went out and then I came in and I, a lot of nights actually just laid in this awful bed and was like shaking and crying and was really, really depressed. Um, luckily, one of my best friends, Henry, came and he gave me ice cream and, you know, took care of me a lot. And, um, you know, time heals all wounds when it comes to stuff like that. But I think if you also, if you don't go through those emotions, you also don't really, for me, care. I, and I'm also like, I'm not afraid of showing feelings or, or you know, sensibility or, or, or sadness because I'm also really, you know, people ask me when I, when I finish competing, are you really always that happy? And I was like, yeah. Because, you know, every time you finish a good ride, you know, all the work you put in is really there. And I think when I came home from the Olympia, I was also really like very run down, very, felt very alone, very not in a good place. But again, a very good support team, including my wife, who actually eventually said, hey, you have to step out of this. You have to move on. Like it's, it happened. It's not going to change. You know, you have other horses, you have a family, like, come on, make yourself but again, like even when I went back to the first show after, I was still, all the things came back, seeing everybody riding, seeing everybody, you know, because I, I'm not sure if I would have taken a medal, but I had a good chance to be in the, in the top. And, you know, and seeing everybody competing, it was, it, I'm not going to deny it. It was a hard, hard time. But also hard times makes you stronger and that also makes you more competitive. All eyes on Paris. All eyes on Paris. I can't wait for that. Paris is going to be like the Insane. coolest thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so we're here in France and we have to say that the French dressage team has been quite weak uh, for a decade or so now. Um, on the contrary, the Swedish team has five riders uh, in the world's top 50. How can you explain that some countries like the Netherlands, like Germany, Denmark and Sweden have been so strong while countries like French, that was historically a huge nation of dressage, has having hard times to constitute competitive teams at the moment. I think it's a little bit of different things because like, for example, France is very successful in jumping. Like when I see like Kevin Stout, when I see all these really good French guys riding, they've been, you know, taking medals and jumping. They, I think a little bit with the, with the, with the jumping breeding, obviously in France was very successful. They got, a little bit. It's a bit of what do you call? It? I call it a combination between luck, money, breeding, trainers, you know, vets, and I think time also involves a bit. With Margaret de Crepin, who was a very successful French rider, she had the right horse. It, you know, it's the same with 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 Holland, with Netherlands. They were nothing until Anki started coming, and then suddenly she was really good, and then she started taking medal, and then they got a system, and then you know, and then suddenly got up there. The Germans are successful to me because they have a very clear way. They have built up programs from kids. They they catch up all the riders to, to help to train. When I watch, I'm very, obviously because I live in Germany and also very good friends with, for example, Monica Tedoresco is the team trainer also, a very, very bright woman. Really, they discuss things. They're straightforward. There is, there's no fluffing around, you know, okay, this we have to do and this we have to do. And I think some countries, they have so many people involved, but it's so many people that has a lot of opinion, but they don't really bring anything to the table, you know. And I think like when I see German also, it's like a couple of people that are quite strong and, and we set up the system a little bit and we help and we, we work together. And I think maybe like, I mean, I'm not gonna, I don't know how the French structure is done, but I think for me, it's like when you when you get everybody involved a bit more, that you're not like everybody's here and here. So when you actually get together and get a strategy to, okay, what do we need? What money? What sponsors? What trainers? What shows? What? That's when you start building. But it takes also time. You know, it takes 
five, six, seven, ten years to build up a top top team. We are experiencing the emergence of a young generation of talented riders, such as Morgan, such as uh, Juan Matsutegimon, whom we already interviewed, or the last Olympic champion, Jessica Van Bredo. Uh, what do you think about this new rising gen generation? Are you confident about the future of dressage? I'm definitely confident about it. That's never a problem because people will always love riding. And I think when people understand how beautiful the sport is and how cool it is to be able to you know, with just small aids, get the horses to do all of these things. I mean, it's pretty amazing that we can get them to understand what we want. And then the, also the people that you mentioned, Morgan is a super rider, Jessica, fantastic uh, rider, Catherine Dafour, Juan. I mean, just with Juan, with his uh, accident and his way of living, his, I call him Smiley. He has a really super character, like in this point, it's exactly what we need. And I think that if there's something that I always say is that we have to be more open to the people. Like, I'm not saying prostituting after sport, but we have to sell the sport. We have to smile to the people. We have to look at the price giving, wave to the people, look at the people, talk to the people. When, don't make them feel like they cannot get close to you. And I think that is really the key thing. Like, you have to, like I did with the kids yesterday, you know, like, do like high five. You know, one of those kids is going to be like, Wow, and then he's going to start riding or she's going to start riding and then they're going to be, and that's the next generation. But if I just like go straight past them and grunt at them and I say, "Oh, why should I do dressage?" they're like all snobs. Yeah. And it, and it goes that quickly because like a kid, you f you form a kid in seconds of their opinion. So I I I always like, you know, let people applaud, let people show emotions. You know what I mean? Like okay, if my horse jumps then out, well, then it has to learn to cope with that. Because we need that environment to get the sport going. You, you, you cannot just be riding and think about only that. You have to think about the people who are here, the kids, the generations. That's what you have to think about. So we're getting closer to the end of the interview, but we still have two, three questions. Yeah, yeah you sure. good? Question um, on. <laughs> <laughs> so what the best piece of riding advice you have ever received? Oh, wow, that is a tough one. Um, I think, I don't know if I received that, but I think the, uh, uh, is that no matter who you train with, no matter who you take like education from, learn from them, try to do it, but don't become them. Become your own. You know what I mean? Like when I started, I, I, I trained with so many good trainers, but I, I also had so much respect for them that I tried to be like them. But I cannot be like them because I'm not built like them. I, I'm, I'm not the same. You know, we are not the same. So I need to build my own and then take influence from them. I think it's, a, it's a, maybe what I gave myself or what I would give other people. Trust your own feeling and take then advices from others into your own system. But don't try to be somebody else. You can never be someone else. You can only be you. And I wish I would have learned that earlier in my career because I think then I would have had a lot more self-confidence to be even a better rider than I am now. Now I am much more secure in myself because I, I know that and I respect all my colleagues so much. But I will never ride like Isabel or Jessica or, or because I can't. But we are not the same. So, But I can look at them and I can learn and I can go to Isabel and she can kick me in the butt and say, you know, get your shoulders straight, sit straight, look straight, da ba ba and I can take that into my input and I can change my way. And I think that is the best tip I maybe gave myself or what I would give other people is that be yourself and, and develop yourself as a human. The last one question, Patrick. Where do you see yourself 10 years from now? Well, you know, as, as, a, as a rider, you keep pushing up the expired date. You know, you started in within like 46 and long time in the sport and you're like... Ooh, I feel like very old. It's like the, what you call it, the, the walk helper no. is coming as the next one. Um, I think for me, I would like to do Los Angeles Olympic. And I would also, because Brisbane, my wife is from Australia. Uh, I'd say Brisbane, 32. But then I, I think I would really, it's 10 years from now. Then I'm, you know, I'm 55 or 56. And then eventually you also, you know, you need to also trap down. Will I always ride? Definitely. As long as I'm alive, I will crawl on a horse no matter what. If I'm, you know, 70, 80, 90 or 100, I will always 
always be around horses, always ride, no matter what. Competitive, give me another 10 years and I'll be okay. But I will still be involved in the sport. You know, I like organizing shows. I like spending time with young people. I like coaching. I, you know, like be involved, do all of these things. And that I will always do until I, you know, leave. Do you think you might have to, you know, follow your daughter at some point or train her? <laughs> to be honest, I don't know. She likes riding. She doesn't ride every day. But when she rides a pony called Diesel, then she really rides. Then it's an hour of riding. But then it also goes two weeks and she doesn't ride at all. And she does other things, paints and, you know. To be really honest, if she wants to ride, I would be super happy. Let her ride. But if she plays tennis... And that's her passion. I'm equally super happy. I don't care what she does. As long as she does something that she wants to do, she has passion for, she wants to live for. And, and for me, it's totally fine. Because in, in the end of the day, I, I feel so lucky that I, my entire life, I've always been able, even if I didn't have anything to start off, I always had security, you know, someone who believed in me, and all these things. So I have my entire life always lived how I wanted. And I think that's a blessing in itself that you can do that. And that's exactly what I would like to give my daughter. You should, you know, live the life that you want to live. Do the things you want to do. If you want to have, you know, 10 kids and be a mommy, then do that. If you want to do sport, do that. I don't care as long as she's happy. That's the only thing I care about. That's a perfect word to conclude uh, our interview. Thank you, Thank you so very much. much. And uh, we really hope to be able to uh, cheer for you in uh, Paris. Yeah. Please do, because I cannot think of anything else than riding in front of that castle and that I just see the gardens, you know, like, I was like, okay, this is cool. That will be amazing. I will be. See you there. Thank I'll you see you guys much. there. It's been a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you so much.